Hi, I'm Dan Cordopassi. Welcome to the SP Concess Build. In this series, I'm working to make HO scale models of five locomotives that I saw in the front of a Southern Pacific freight train in Truckee, California in 1993. This episode is going to focus once more on the Conrail unit, SD40 number 6283. In the last episode, I installed more LED lighting in my Conrail SD40 number 6283. Like I did in episode 8 where I focused on LEDs, in this episode I'm going to change things up a little and focus on preparing can and cab interior kits. I'll be using one of these in Conrail 6283 and two more in each of the Southern Pacific SD45Rs in this build. Since I'll be using the same kit in three different locomotives, and since these can be used in many other EMD locomotives as well, I wanted to make this a standalone episode. That way I won't have to cover the same ground again in the future, and it'll be easy for people to refer back to if needed. My goals for this time are to build the Canon cab interior kits, paint the cab interior kits, and install one of the cab interiors in Conrail 6283. I'll save the other two for later. Before we get to the cab interior, I've mentioned in previous episodes that my model of Conrail 6283 is one that I've built and finished once already. I left some things out that I include on most of the models that I build now, like Canon fans, so for the Consist build series I decided to take it apart and rebuild it. I was going through my computer and found some work in progress photos of the model the first time I built it. I thought they might be interesting to share. This model started as a Kato SD40 that if I recall was painted in CSX colors. I stripped the paint with a hobby sandblaster. In these photos you can see the unpainted Canon cab and short hood. The subbase is a Kato part, possibly borrowed from a Santa Fe unit judging by the yellow color. The model also has photo etched steps installed at the corners. The pilots have been reworked and by this time I'd already installed my custom Penn Central style uncoupling levers. For this episode I'll be using Canon part 1554, an EMD Spartan cab interior kit. These kits can be used for any EMD Spartan cab locomotive, including GP35s, SD40-2s, GP60s, and more. The kit is fairly basic. It includes a cab floor, front bulkhead, rear bulkhead, parts for the control stand, a cab heater, and seats. The instructions mention two ways to use this kit. If you build, paint, and install the kit before assembling the cab, you can keep the cab interior in one piece and lower it down into the cab before attaching the roof. I've never found this way to be very practical, so I go with the second method, which is to cut the cab floor in half and install the interior in pieces. This will result in a gap in the middle of the cab floor, but it's almost impossible to see on a finished model, so I think it's acceptable. I'll start by removing the larger parts from the plastic trees using my sprue cutter. A small file is good for cleaning up any excess plastic or flash. One of the seat backs on my kit had some flash. For small parts like this, sometimes it's easier to clean them up before cutting them off the trees. The cab floor has a hump in the middle to clear the drive shaft in a typical HO scale diesel. This is the area I'll need to cut out to separate the floor into two pieces. I'll cut one side by making several passes with my hobby knife, then snapping the plastic. A motor tool also works. Either way, a large mill file is good for cleaning up the edges. Now I have two floor pieces, one for the engineer side, and one for the fireman's side. Note that I've cut out the humped area completely. That will help give me some room to maneuver the parts when it comes time to install the floor. The cab heater is almost impossible to see in the finished model, so I usually leave it out. I'll save this one for my scrap box. The control stand has several parts. The large piece with a shallow V-shape is the main part. There are three flat pieces, and there is one more piece on the parts tree with the seats. The flat pieces fit into rectangular holes on the back of the main part. The edges are notched so that they should snap into place. Once they're in the right spot, I'll use some liquid styrene cement to secure them. When all three are glued, it should look like this. The last part of the control stand is the brake valve. After studying several photos of EMD cab interiors, it looks like the rectangular piece is the top. The brake valve is designed to fit over the area with the two dimples in the main part, though it has no corresponding pins on the back. You could glue this now, but I'm going to hold off until after I've painted all the parts. For now, I'll stick the brake valve to a piece of masking tape. The instrument panel on the control stand has slots where the throttle and dynamic brake levers are on the real thing. This is going to be hard to see on the finished model, but if you want to, you can add levers here with some small wire. I'm going to do it just to show how I approach it. It's not that difficult. This is some O10 phosphor bronze wire from Titchy, part 1101. Any small wire like this would work. First, I'll drill mounting holes inside the slots where the levers go with the number 78 drill bit. I'll put a small drop of CA on the end of a wire and insert it into one of the holes. Then I'll snip off the excess. After inserting two wires, I now have dynamic brake and throttle handles. 
I've put the completed control stand on a piece of masking tape for painting. Now I'll remove the seat bottoms and seat backs from the trees. The seat backs have two pins that fit into corresponding holes in the seat bottoms. Holding the two parts for each seat in close contact to apply glue is difficult, so first I'm going to put a tiny drop of CA on one side to tack glue the parts. Then I can use some liquid styrene cement to make a permanent bond. A pin on the bottom of each seat fits into a hole on the floor. There's one hole on the engineer's side and two on the fireman's side. The seat bottoms usually fit pretty securely into the hole in the floor, so they'll stay put when they're being glued. The seats can be installed in a swiveled position if you like. I swiveled the rear seat on the fireman's side slightly, though again, this is not going to be very visible when the parts are inside the model. I assembled two more cab interior kits and now have the parts for all three ready for painting. One will go into my Conrail SD40 and the other two are for my SP SD45Rs. Before I paint, I want to make sure that there are no skin oils or other contaminants on the parts. I'll carefully go over them with a microbrush soaked in isopropyl alcohol. I don't have definitive reference shots of any of the cab interiors of the locomotives I'm modeling in this build. Looking at photos online, it appears that the most likely interior color is a pale gray. I found some polyscale CSX gray in my stash of paints. This is old but thankfully still viable. I'll thin the paint with some Windex for airbrushing. I'm painting all of the parts the same color except for the control stands. I've taped the parts to a piece of scrap wood to make them easier to handle while painting. The control stands are separate from the other parts. I'll start with some white Tamiya Fine Surface Primer. This paint goes on very thin. The quality of the finish is similar to airbrushing but with less work. Once the primer is dry, I'll spray the gray. Multiple thin coats give a better finish than trying to put too much paint on too quickly. For the control stands, I'm using Tester's Model Master Flat Black. As with the gray, I'll thin this paint with a few drops of Windex. After giving the paint some time to cure, I put the painted control stands on some fresh tape to hold them while I work. First, I'll attach the part with the brake lever. I should note that in some photos I've found of cab interiors, this part is also black. Some were gray, and I thought it looked a little more interesting like that. I use a small brush to highlight the brake lever with red paint. I'll also use some red on the throttle and dynamic brake levers. The top of the brake stand is black in most of the photos I've seen, so I'll use some black on a brush to paint that area. A little black weathering powder on the brake stand will help to bring out the details. I'll use a pencil on the dials on the top of the control stand to simulate the reflections from the glass that covers the gauges on the real thing. For the seat cushions, I'm using Tester's Model Master Leather. Now all the seats are painted. I'll use a couple drops of CA to attach the completed control stand to the engineer's side of the cab floor. The interior kits are now essentially complete. I'll set two of them aside for the SP SD45Rs. Usually when I put in one of these kits, I end up having to make some holes in the front and rear bulkheads for wires or fiber optics. In this model, the fiber optics for the nose, class, or marker lights are running right through the center of the cab area. While I could probably make this work, I decided to change the way I'm doing these lights. Instead of a single 3mm LED as I'd originally planned, I made a couple of light mounts for 603 red LEDs. These are nearly identical to the ones that I made for the rear of this unit. If you'd like to see how I did that, please refer back to episode 9. I'll use my sprue cutters to trim the fiber optic strands shorter. I've installed the light mounts inside the short hood. It'll be easier to deal with small wires going through the cab than the fiber optic strands. Whenever I install LEDs, I like to test them to make sure that they're working before proceeding. These look good. I've twisted the LED wires together to make things a little neater and make it easier to run them through the cab. The front and rear bulkheads have a curved area at the bottom. In most models, if you keep wires above this area, then there's no chance that they'll get caught up in the model's drivetrain. I've taped the front bulkhead to a piece of scrap wood to hold it while I drill a hole through the metal. The hole size isn't critical, but it has to be big enough for the wires to pass through. I've pulled the wires through the bulkhead. Now I can glue it in place. The bulkhead should fit so that the top is just below the bottoms of the front middle cab windows. The rear bulkhead is a little bit more complicated. It's designed to go up all the way to the top of the cab roof, but because of all the lights, fiber optics, and support structure I put in there, I'm going to need to cut it a little. I'll use a leftover scrap of the material that I used to make the number board light box to mark how much to cut away. I cut a notch in the middle for the headlight fiber optics and other wires, but because of the way I built the light supports in the roof of the cab, this won't quite fit. I'm carving a little off the top on both sides of my notch. Like I did with the front bulkhead, I've taped this part to a piece of scrap wood so that I can drill holes in it. I've put three holes in the bulkhead. 
The center hole is for the class light wires. The other two are for the ground lights. I probably could get away with one hole for all of that, but keeping them separate will help me to tell them apart later. I installed the rear bulkhead with liquid styrene cement. The class light wires are through the center hole. The ground light wires go through the holes on the sides. Note that I've left the ground light wires a little bit loose for now until I get the rest of the cab interior installed. Since I opted to install the cab in pieces, I can't fit the bulkheads on top of the floor as it's designed. I'll need to trim a little bit off the front and back ends of the floor to shorten it. If you wanted to add crew figures, now would be the time. I'm not going to do that on this engine, so I'll just maneuver the fireman's side seats into the cab. I made an improvised tool by bending the end of a paper clip into an L shape. This next part can be a little tricky. While holding the cab floor against the cab subbase with the tool I made, I'll apply some liquid styrene cement. Now that I have both sides of the cab floor installed, I'll put some black paint on the wires running through the center to make them less visible. The last step is to use some Kapton tape. This is a very thin insulating tape that's good for DCC installations. I'm putting a piece on each side to hold the wires for the ground lights and hopefully keep them from getting snagged on the mechanism when the engine is put back together. It's a little hard to see, but the cab interior is visible through the cab windows. It's definitely better than having nothing in there. This is a good place to leave things for now. Next time I'll install the decoder and put the shell and chassis back together. Having a cab interior in a model is better than having nothing inside the cab. However, because it's difficult to see, it's not really necessary for the interior to be as detailed as the outside. There's nothing wrong with putting more detail in there if you want to, but for me at least it becomes a question of how much modeling time do I want to spend on things that won't really improve the appearance of the finished model. Despite my best efforts, I was not able to come up with a definitive answer on what color the cab interior should be on this model. I went with a gray color since it seemed like a lot of similar units were painted that way. The good thing is, because it's not that visible, even if I later find out that the color is incorrect, it won't distract much from the overall appearance of the finished model. The bulkheads at the front and rear of the cab can be drilled out and used as holders for fiber optics or wires. Doing this helps to reduce the number of loose wires inside a model, especially models like this one with a lot of lights. The interior is hard to see anyway, and if you drill the holes in the right places, they'll be all but invisible when the model is put together. I think the Conrail unit is really starting to shape up. Next time I'm going to add the decoder and get it running. Stay tuned and thanks for watching.